Yeah, welcome everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present here. Um, and also thank you, Carson, for putting me in this like uh, tight spot between the authorities talking about the CRA and the lawyers with proper interpretation of the law. And now here I am uh, talking about what can possibly happen when the CRA hits um, our ecosystem. Um, let's see. Um, who are we? Linux Foundation Europe is the European chapter of the Linux Foundation. We host a couple of projects in Europe. Um, some of these projects are specifically responding to EU regulation, so that it makes sense. Um, and as you know, uh, Linux Foundation hosts a couple of very large open source collaborations like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation or the Linux Kernel. And we are basically representing all these activities in Europe, including in Brussels. And that's, I think, why I'm here. Because I spent a bit more time than expected in Brussels in my first year at the Linux Foundation. Um, who am I? Um, community development is a very broad mandate. I basically bring everybody together and then um, present in Brussels what we discuss. I'm an open source contributor since 97, and I teach open source and intellectual property from an economic, not legal perspective at the TU Berlin. Um, yeah, that should be enough. So one caveat. Um, as you know, predictions are always very difficult, especially about if they're about the future. And um, the CRA has been um, approved on 12 March. It is now being published. It will be implemented in the next three years. The standards have not been written yet. The guidance document has not been published yet. So everything we talk about here today um, it, it, in my presentation is essentially conjecture. We're, we're projecting how will this impact the open source ecosystem. Um, and I really like, I'm really envious to the lawyers in this case, because they can actually read all these 338 pages and everything is totally clear, right? Isn't it? And it's like no contradictions there. It's the law. It's done. Um, so, so we actually have to hallucinate better here than chat GPT. Um, so, and I'm also not a lawyer. So let's jump in. Um, we have actually different numbers of policy goals for the uh, EU Cyber Resilience Act today. I have three. Um, reduce the vulnerabilities in digital products. Ensure, uh, ensure cybersecurity is maintained throughout the product's lifecycle and enable users to make informed decisions when they select products and operate them. Um, it's a horizontal uh, regulation, meaning everybody who offers digital products in the European market has to comply with it, no matter where they sit. Um, and maybe one, um, like already opening this, uh, this perspective that this is not just the regulation about cybersecurity. This is actually a positioning of the EU in this whole ecosystem. In the text, in the preamble, it says the EU intends to lead, uh, play a leading international role in cybersecurity regulation, meaning the Cyber Resilience Act was one of the first regulations that were actively written, written, um, with the idea in mind that this will be exported into other regions. Um, this is an experience from the uh, GDPR, um, where it happened more or less accidentally. And um, it's been called the Brussels effect at times. And I think after this experience with the GDPR, the EU is now grabbing this idea by the horns and say, we are a major economic bloc, uh, one third of the global economy. Everybody, no, nobody can afford not to offer products in Europe. And therefore, if we regulate cybersecurity properly, it will actually benefit the whole world. Um, and this is uh, maybe one indicator why this new upcoming regulation um, gathers so much attention. Um, so let's jump in. Um, a, a key aspect that Till mentioned very briefly, but I think is absolutely crucial about uh, for the relationship between the open source ecosystem and, and uh, the commercial manufacturers is this distinction between manufacturers and open source software stewards. Um, the proper term is open source software stewards. We just call them stewards later, but um, software is important here. Why? Because it's not about stakeholders. It's not about interest groups. It's not about people who also have an opinion about open source. It is about organizations that are typically nonprofit that ha have specific responsibility for specific open source projects. Um, those are the stewards, people who steer these projects. Um, how does the, the COA break this down? First, a very important provision. 
is that the, um, the, the, the release of open source software products that are not monetized, or basically the way the open source community does it, is not considered a commercial activity. It makes this very explicit. It says, releasing an open source software component does not mean introducing this product into the market. Um, so that also means that the development the activities or the stewardship activities of these non-profit organizations of us is not considered a commercial activity. And um, it also makes it very explicit that manufacturers should exercise due diligence when they are consuming open source components from upstream and integrating them into their products. And this, this sentence makes it very clear who bears the responsibility for bringing open source components into the market. It is the first manufacturer in the software supply chain that takes it from upstream and integrates it into a commercially provided product. Um, and the EU intends to support this transition from upstream into the commercial manufacturing realm um, through, uh, for example, providing voluntary security attestation programs. So meaning the, the upstream components should come with voluntary attestation that the manufacturers can consume. Um, there's not much more detail provided on, on this um, attestation program as of yet, um, but that's basically um, yeah, a key aspect of, of how the software ecosystem works today, that you have an upstream where we have collaborative development and then manufacturers who consume that product, uh, these components and integrate them into products. And as a result, very important, we have two separate operator roles in the law, manufacturers and open source software stewards. What's the difference between the two? Um, for, for a manufacturer, I think it's not surprising. You have the full range of obligations. Um, basically, you bring products into the market, you're responsible for them. Um, but in the same article, one paragraph later, we have the definition of what is an open source software steward who will be um, regulated with a light touch regulatory regime. What exactly that means is not clear yet and um, not very clear. And light touch is also not really a defined term, but let's see. Um, a manuf an open source software steward is any legal person other than a manufacturer. That's in the text. Which has the purpose to systematically provide support for free you know, software products and ensure their viability. So um, sometimes in our ecosystem, we, we refer to these organizations as code hosting organizations, the ones that are responsible for specific products or components. Um, a typical steward would be the Rust Foundation um, or the Python Software Foundation or the Linux Foundation or the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and this is also the, the setup that the EU had in mind. Um, it, very interestingly, if you look into the details, um, between the lines, you'll find a lot of expectation about open governance and collaborative development here. So it's not just about the licensing of the software. It's not enough to say we release this on an open source license. There are implicit and explicit requirements about a collaborative and open development process to be called a software steward. And um, of course, if you are an organization that is responsible for an open source project, then you want to rather be an, an open source software steward if you're not a commercial company because you have that light touch regulatory regime. So it's important to understand this difference. Um, so in short, let's start with this distinction. We have two separate operator roles, manufacturers and open source software stewards. Manufacturers are companies, and um, I think you're well uh, familiar with that. Open source software steward is new. It's a, uh, an environment where you're not... Um, monetizing, you're not commercially providing products, but you or you feel responsible for specific open source products that you release. Now, if, if we look at this distinction, it assumes a certain maturity of the setup. Um, say a major manufacturer works with a large open source foundation who hosts the Linux kernel. Um, but that's kind of the um, a very mature state of this development. I'd like to point out that over time, open source projects change their nature. They usually start as, as very small, cool projects. Uh, somebody has a great idea and sits down on a free afternoon on the weekend and, and makes the 
skeleton for the project publishes it. And at this moment, it is a single vendor project, basically, because you have one contributor. Um, and, and it can stay like that for quite some time. And um, it can actually develop to be quite successful. We, we know of projects that are maintained by a single person. That's why everybody's showing this uh, XCD comic. Um, at this time, I can say, if that's an individual contributor who publishes their software to GitHub, that's not covered by the CRA, but we'll get into that. But the problem is that, of course, every project that you publish this way has the intention to grow. But that's why you're doing it. You're inviting contributors to participate in your project. And even at this point, very early, you will have to make a, a path decision. You will decide, is this going to be a, a like free software, volunteer, non-commercial community? Left side of the picture here, where you in, your bodies start to uh, uh, congregate around the project. You have regular contributions from different people. Um, but you maybe decide, oh, this is an open source project. We're going to start our own small non-profit organization that hosts this project. And then you end up like the Rust Foundation. Right? So um, no intention to monetize. And the path decision that you make is, I'm going to be an open source, an open source software steward. Like my organization, my community, is going to be a steward for our project. You could join one of the bigger foundations uh, and have them host the, the project then they will be the steward and you will be a project under their stewardship. Um, so, the, but the path decisions you made and, and the maturity process that your project went through is from a small community of your project to one that is incorporated as a nonprofit, for example, uh, or in a foundation and is now under stewardship. The other path decision you could make is to say, wow, this idea has legs. I would like to make this into a company. We will develop as an open source software, but I would like to make this into a startup. Then you make a, take a decision to the right here and you say, okay, so let's start a company. Let's hire some developers and publish this on, um, still as open source, but it's now a product. Um, and you've made the decision to become a manufacturer. You will not be a steward and you will not enjoy a light touch regulatory regime. And of course, your company can grow to be a small or medium-sized enterprise, or it can grow to be a unicorn. Great. Um, but you will be a manufacturer. And depending on the so two things here, one is software projects change their nature over time. And kind of when you cross these dotted lines, then your obligations of the law changes. And um, I think manufacturers really become stewards or the other way around. But um, small projects driven by volunteers may grow, and then at some point, become more formally organized and then change the nature to be either a steward or a manufacturer. And it's important, I think, to be aware when you cross this threshold because your obligations will change. Um, so yeah, um, when you read the text, you identify a couple of um, relatively clever um, provisions for who's responsible for what. Individual developers, as long as their participation is non-commercial, are exempt. Um, that would be in the picture of the slide before, below the threshold. Um, so I don't think the CAA will impact um, small hobbyist projects that a person publishes on, on, on the Git repository somewhere. Um, that solves a small problem. Um, we have some gray area in the JavaScript community where you have many components that are just 50 lines of code, rarely ever maintained. Um, uh, I don't think this will be something that is impacted by the CRA, even though many security issues come up from that direction. Um, contributing to projects that are not under your own responsibility is also exempt in, in that way that the responsibility lies with the upstream project that accepts your contribution. This is a very important point that we argued in Brussels a lot about, that we said it's not the contributor who's responsible for the project. They are offering their code for integration and the project integrates it. And so you have to ask who's responsible for the project and that entity is responsible under the CRA. Um, now, of course, and it's probably, probably better to ask still about the details here, but if you as an individual incorporate a single person company, then you're probably a manufacturer and not an individual. Um, and, and you can also like, Actually, you cannot be a steward as an individual, but with a small group, uh, you can. Um, there was some um, ambiguity in the text if an individual can become a steward or not, but this has been resolved. 
an individual should not be a steward, according to European Commission. Um, so basically, the takeaway is projects grow from, from a small idea to large communities or to businesses. Um, and it's important to, to manage these transitions and understand when you take them. So we're investigating a bit how will this impact the open source ecosystem. The first thing we can say here is um, that the EU raises the bar for open source governance. Um, this is the first time that we see implicit requirements and explicit requirements on how open source projects are run. For example, the statement that should be non-profit. Um, and and um, when you say, why governance? Governance is important. Governance, uh, an and open source researcher, me, has written sometimes that um, governance determines the growth capabilities of open source communities. Like the stronger your governance is, the larger the project is that you can handle. So it's natural that a project like the Cloud Native Computing Foundation needs a more formalized and more organized governance than a small community with 10 contributors. Um, and a couple of best practices have evolved. Like how do you manage big projects? For example, you have a separation between technical and project governance with a technical steering committee and a governing board who don't interfere with each other. Um, and if you read between the lines of the Cyber Resilience Act, you find a lot of these ideas represented. So projects should be hosted under a neutral place, not by a single manufacturer, but at a steward where many people can collaboratively develop it and they're openly governed. So you find ideas that represent open source governance in the text. They're not very explicit. But if you look at how should I set up an organization that is an open source software steward, you realize that you have to follow up the, many of the best practices developed in the open source ecosystems. Uh, ecosystems. One reason here is that the, the commission tried to ensure that projects like uh, the Android open source project or Chromium are considered to be developed by manufacturers, not by a steward, which is the case because they're single um, company projects with no open collaborative development process. Um, and that's where these more strict requirements come from. It's not enough to just point to the license. Um, the question that I get a lot, probably the most common question is, how will contributors be affected by, uh, by this law? And the first question I ask back is, contributors to what? Because it's not like contributors are not the same. If you have an in-house employee who uh, contributes to your in-house project, then this is basically internal to, to you as a manufacturer. This is not a question of it. The person is a contributor to your source project, but the responsibilities are purely yours as a manufacturer. If you have a contributor to a project under somebody else's responsibility, as I said, this is not covered by the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, if you have external contributors to your in-house project, then the responsibilities are with the project host. So um, it's not enough to look at the, like the, the individual contributor. You have to look at where the project is hosted and who holds the responsibility for the project. As I said, individual contributors are mostly exempt. Um, uh, however, we do already see that there may be uncertainty and insecurity about potential responsibilities. Uh, I provide commercial development services and I also contribute to this project. Can this be interpreted as me doing this in a commercial fashion? Um, these are all questions that the lawyers should answer. I'm just saying that I get these questions a lot from nervous contributors. Um, it's also possible that individual contributors are unwilling to enter, for example, contributor license agreements to clarify that and just walk away from projects. So there might be an impact to contributions, meaning that you get less, fewer contributions, because there's a higher bureaucratic hurdle. Um, and we could ask, why is that important? But there is an important role of the individual volunteer con contributor base that we have in our ecosystem. Um, they have traditionally been the drivers of experimentation and innovation. Um, open source projects are successful because if you do something not great, Somebody else will come around and do it better. This is like release early, release often, trial and error. Um, and much of this is driven by very motivated, enthusiastic individuals. If we create a higher bar for individuals to contribute to open source, we may undermine the innovativeness um, of this ecosystem. Um, yeah, so this is something that we did discuss with the European Commission. The impact of this is very, like, very difficult to assess. Um, but I, I have a, di a hard time imagining it as a positive impact. Like it can be mitigated, but I don't see how this raises more contributions than before.
Um, when you look at manufacturers specifically, uh, many people talk about new responsibilities for manuf uh, manufacturers. And, and I'm not, I don't mean this from a legal perspective. Um, the, the law specifies certain, uh, the regulation specifies certain responsibilities, but are they really new? If you look into the Cyber Resilience Act, it codifies many industry good practices. Um, for example, uh, being transparent about your cybersecurity practices, allowing in a mechanism for reporting them and for inquiring for consumers to inquire about them, secure by default design, reasonable support periods, all of that is something that a, a good manufacturer should be doing anyway. And so um, I don't think that the COA imposes a lot of very new obligations on manufacturers that take their responsibilities for products seriously. Um, it makes these implicit responsibilities, like you need to fix the security vulnerabilities in your products and provide these updates to your consumers, um, it makes them explicit. So I think in that regard, this could be a beneficial to, to those manufacturers who take it seriously because it levels the playing field. It will be more difficult in the future for others to fire and forget bad products into the market and never care about them. So um, I wouldn't um, like stand up in alarm and run away and say, I'm never introducing a product in Europe again. Um, if you um, analyze this uh, regulation in depth, you realize that it might be an opportunity for, for many manufacturers. Um, what are these obligations? I'm not sure if we uh, spoke about this um, in, in, in much detail in the previous presentation, so let's look at this a little bit. Um, so as a manufacturer, you must supply vulnerability fixes throughout the support period. Um, and should, the products should be designed in a way that they support software updates and ideally in an automated fashion because one of the key aspects is the rollout of security fixes to where the devices are after you sell them. Um, if you enter support, this must be clearly communicated to the user without restricting the functionality and security updates must be provided separately from functional updates and for free. And the support period should be, should, what period should be no less than five years. Um, there are caveats here, details, but basically the key takeaway is five years is a long time to support a digital product. Um, and I think this is one of the key mechanisms, levers, that the European Commission applies to the market and says, if you introduce a product, we want you to fix any upcoming vulnerability. Why for free? Because they view it as the consumer has paid for a product and your product has a flaw. So you you need to update it and you can't charge the consumer for this fix. Um, there are details about um, do you have to provide them separately, etc. But I, I abstracted away from that for the presentation. Um, in comparison, what are the, the responsibility uh, or responsibilities of an open source software steward? Um, the, the first aspect to, to be aware of here is, is that the legal entity is the open source software steward, not necessarily a project. So Linux Foundation hosts about 900 and something open source projects small to large, funded to non-funded, um, and all of almost all of them are hosted either by Linux Foundation Europe or Linux Foundation in the US. So you have two stewards to work with, not 800. Um, so one question to ask is, is, which is the legal entity? Like, who am I talking to? Who is the steward of this project? Um, as a steward, we're supposed to have a single point of contact for reporting and acquiring about vulnerabilities for you. Um, we should implement a cybersecurity policy, communicate it, and that should include ways for consumers to report vulnerabilities back to the projects. Uh, we are required to work with market uh, surveillance authorities um, to provide information about the software releases, et cetera, and to notify widely about um, reported vulnerabilities. Um, one key aspect is for us as stewards that the expectation is that we're non-profit, also when we do generate revenue, for example, through membership fees. Um, this, this must be documented because it does, it's a, there's a requirement that the funding available to the organization is used in a way that remains non-profit. All of this is not final because of, uh, details here are partially in the guidance document that we're waiting for. Um, now, as I said, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm mostly um, presenting here how I understand the text. Um, but there are some high-level implications. Um, one is that the, the maintenance of components that you use is becoming a corporate responsibility. 
Um, essentially, if you rely on an open source component in your product, then you have a choice. You either can maintain an in-house fork for the lifetime of your product, or you work with upstream so that you can get security fixes for that component throughout, throughout the lifetime of the product. Um, I believe working together with upstream is the more efficient way because you can share the maintenance burden with everybody else who uses that component. But if you do that, then you have to make sure that the project stays viable as long as you need it. So projects are not just about development. They're also about the organizations that host them, the others that are participating in them, et cetera. So um, this requires you to engage with the projects from which you are consuming code uh, and to build a relationship with them that matches your long-term long -term, uh, maintenance requirements. Um, I think to get to this point requires a high level of maturity in, in, in like of understanding of you know, how your open source ecosystem works from a commercial perspective, which I haven't found in all companies that I've worked in. Um, so uh, if you consider open source consumption primarily as a legal risk um, and, and guide your developers not to contribute upstream, then you will have trouble collaboratively maintaining your upstream components with others. So this will be a shift, a push, uh, for those manufacturers that don't yet participate upstream um, to do that or to bear the full maintenance cost in-house. Um, I don't think that's a, a viable option. Um, and as a result, we will have a, a more pronounced relationship between the upstream communities and the manufacturers. Um, the upstream projects host, pro uh, the upstream uh, organization hosts the open source projects under neutral governance meaning uh, open to it for anybody to participate. Uh, you're basically invited. I can say that for all projects that I know and that the Linux Foundation hosts, uh, participation in the technical development process does not require membership. Um, you can become a maintainer of the software through contribution primarily. Um, but of course, we invite you to also participate in the governance of the projects, meaning co-funding them. Um, Let's talk a bit about the role of maintainers. There's often the expectation that uh, maintainers are upstream. Like I develop my contributions, I uh, push them to the, I offer them for integration and the maintainers will just take care of that. Um, and this was also one misunderstanding that was made by the European Commission about how open source works. And we have to explain to them, as the upstream communities, basically you can visualize us as hosters of Git repositories. Even the maintainers of the software are working downstream in some of the companies. We don't employ developers or maintainers, 99%. Um, that means we have to understand how the collaborative development process works and that most people who participate in this process don't owe you anything. I've added a link to this uh, really well-written article that explains that you cannot go to an open source maintainer and say, I have a release to make next Friday, so you better fix this bug by Monday. Um, this is not how open source works. I think everybody here in the room knows that, but this requires us to develop a collaboration where we can still make our deadline next Friday. Um, so the takeaway from this slide is that we will have to develop this um, more pronounced relationship between the manufacturers and the upstream communities, um, which breaks down to collaborative lifecycle support. This is what we need to develop. And I, I say we because we as the Linux Foundation are currently looking into how can this be done as well? Um, because um, manufacturers are approaching us and say, how do we implement the Cyber Resilience Act and all these documentation requirements? Um, I think the best way to ensure the viability of an open source dependency is to participate in the governance of this project. I have a great example of the Yocto project, which is used by many companies to build their basic framework for their devices. Um, if that project would go away next year um, and stop developing, then then if, if your product is built on it, you're in trouble. So one thing you want to make sure is that this project does not go away next year. And the best way to do that is to look at the project and say, should I maybe become at least like a silver member in this project, go to the governing board meetings to find a roadmap, make sure this project is funded for 10 years. Um, this is what I mean by participating in governance. Uh, please keep in mind all our projects, I can speak for Linux Foundation here, are non-profit. 
like even like the organization is non-profit and the projects are as well. They are funded by the participating organizations and all the money that goes to the organizations in the, in the, to the projects is invested to the benefit of the project according to what the steering board decides. So it's really collaborative. Um, and your way to participate is to sit on that steering board and say, are we safe? Will this exist 10 years from now? Um, and so one task that I, I keep kind of describing to the open source participants, uh, representations uh, of companies is you need to go, I think, and say, what are my essential dependencies? The things that I cannot replace, the things that my, I built my products on, and, and are these dependencies well governed? Do they have enough contributors and maintainers? And, and can I put maybe participate to ensure that this happens for the next five and 10 years? Um, and you can, you're probably able to say which these key dependencies are. And then you can check, am I engaged with those communities? Do, do I make sure that they remain viable? Um, there are many ambiguities in this text. Um, I listed a couple of them here and they're real questions. We had a, a, a panel discussion at the, Community of a Code Conference last year, the Apache Software Foundation con uh, last week, sorry, Apache Software Foundation Conference in Bratislava, and these are questions that were raised there. Um, for example, many organizations develop open source components and commercial products at the same time, or they are making, primarily making commercial products, and they also support one or two open source components. They're asking, am I then a steward here and a manufacturer there? The answer, short answer is no because a steward is somebody other than a manufacturer, and it's the organization. Um, what a question that was literally asked this way is, will this make the open source ecosystem boring, where it used to be fun? So we asked about impact that this will have. We're basically raising administrative barriers in, in, a, in an ecosystem that so far was mostly self-organized. Um, and yeah, so there's a risk that this will put people off and, reduce their contributions. I hope not. I think we can make this simple enough. So um, if I provide development service for FOSS components, the, the, uh, am I a manufacturer? The answer is it depends and you should go ask Till. Um, because it depends on um, are you are you giving the product to your um, to your client or are you serving the servicing what they consume from upstream? Um, and so on. So there are many questions. Um, this means that a lot of the details of how the service in fact will actually impact us and will be implemented will be in harmonized standards. And we've already heard a lot about this. Um, this is almost, this is a difficult situation because the Cyber Science Act is a very high level law. You can actually read the articles. You don't need to read all the 338 pages. The articles are not that long. Um, and it lays out very basic requirements. And then it says, and the rest will be then done in harmonized standards. And the standard development request that the European Commission is giving to the European Standards Development Organizations contains 41 standards, 41 different standards. 10 or 11 are basic requirements, like what does it mean to ship a product without uh, known vulnerabilities? And the other ones are for specific product uh, cut, uh, classes, the ones that are listed in the annex, um, like cybersecurity requirements for browsers or for identity management systems. And, and many of the details that we are pondering how they will impact us will only be defined. And it was very opt optimistic to say the standards will be available in two years. It's simply from the, num the amount of work that is now being presented to uh, Sensenelec, most probably, um, there's already an indication that the standards drafts will be becoming, will become available two years from now and that they will be finalized just when the three year implementation period ends. Um, and this is a very difficult situation because these standards will have to be implemented by the manufacturers and by us. Um, we responded to the, um, the draft of the standardization request and, and highlighted that, um, first, this requires stricter than usual oversight by the European Commission. Um, you may know that the, the European standards development organizations do not have a very long, a strong history of working with the open source community. Um, and we basically are required to be at the table because all the products that are talking about are developed by the open source communities. Um, and the second requ uh, request we made is that um, we should have a path to proper membership in any of these organizations. Right now we don't. Uh, we can have an associate agreement and maybe be uh, 
um, uh, observers. And we would like to be, especially now that we have a role in the law, um, we would like to be um, evolved. Um, and we also pointed out that um, the, the approach that is taken to standards development here is to ask a, a standards development organization to come up with a new draft, um, while at the same time many open source communities have already implemented well-documented best practices about all of this. So there's a risk here that the standards development organizations will start from scratch and develop everything again and try to replace what the community has developed, and we recommend that that should be avoided. Let's see. Um, Okay, this is mostly what I wanted to, to highlight. Um, as I said, it, it's a bit of we're projecting into the future how will this impact the open source ecosystem. I think it's relatively clear that we will have to develop this more pronounced relationship between manufacturers and stewards, that we have to develop processes and tools and um, even specifications for formats, etc. Um, and the rest is hard to predict, let's say. Maybe in terms of status, I'm not sure if this was ever on, on, on the screen today. So the CIA was approved on 12 March. It will be published. It's currently being translated in all sorts of European languages. Um, and it will then be published probably late in the summer. And then we have a 36 months implementation period um, where the vulnerability reporting obligations kick in after 21 months and then the full obligations at the end of the cycle. So maybe mid to late 27. Um, Maybe one thing to point out, this is the first regulation in a major economic block that uses the words free and open source software in, in a prominent article. Um, this is the first time that um, open source organizations like us uh, are assigned a specific operator role and not considered as non-commercial development. Um, and so I really think that um, this will have a lot of impact both on cybersecurity, but also on future regulation of uh, within the European Union, because now that we have a standing for the open source community in the law in the first place, there will probably be other um, examples where this will follow. A common question to close with that is, will the Cyber Resilience Act lead to better cybersecurity in the EU? Um, will it prevent issues like Heartbeat or XC? Um, I think it will lead to better cybersecurity because making implicit obligations explicit always um, levels the playing field and, and gives you better arguments to invest into cybersecurity for your products. Will it prevent issues like Heartbeat or XE? I don't think the expectation is that such issues will not exist. I think we know that they will come up eventually. Um, the question is how they're how they handled and what the baseline is. How secure are the products when these issues happen? How much can they proliferate? And I think in that regard, the Cyber Resilience Act will support us to better digital products in Europe. Thank you.